New Keynesian economics is a school of modern macroeconomics that looks at the micro foundations that are needed for macro explanations of Keynesian failures. So the new Keynesians are gonna look at price stickiness and the new micro foundations of macroeconomic failure. New Keynesianism is a revival of the classical versus Keynesian debate. It's a response to Robert Lucas and the new classical school. New classical economists criticize the inconsistency of Keynesianism in the light of the economic realities of the 1970s, the failure of the original Phillips curve as a policy menu, and the new macro focus on expectations, and in particular, rational expectation theory. The new classicals combined a unique market clearing equilibrium at full employment, at our aggregate supply, aggregate demand, long run equilibrium at that potential output level. And they did this with the idea of rational expectations. Rational expectations, R-E-T, rational expectations theory, leads to this market clearing outcome for classical economists. So you get R-E-T and markets clear. Rational expectations theory, markets clear. With these new classical ideas, Keynesian macro is seemingly dead. There's no strong argument for activist policy and no reason to manipulate a macro economy that's simply efficiently responding to things like real shocks. We know we have to build expectations into our model. And so there is this policy ineffectiveness proposition about Keynesian monetary stimulus. With rational expectations theory, market expectations adjust to the policy that is being pursued. And thus that policy is impotent. The new classicals have adopted micro stories to show their macro conclusions and theoretically have outdone the Keynesians. The new Keynesians come back against the new classicals and surprisingly use these same micro foundations. They use rational expectations theory, but they argue that we can have RET and yet markets don't clear. We can have rational expectations theory, and yet the market can still show macro failures. So the Keynesians tried the same trick that Friedman originally played on them. Friedman used the Keynesian framework to argue against Keynesian conclusions. The famous quote, we're all Keynesians now, Friedman was saying we're using the Keynesian methodology, and yet he was arguing that within the Keynesian methodology, within their models, the Keynesian conclusions aren't gonna come from these models. New Keynesians are doing the same thing, but back to the classicals. Remember the ideas that are important to Keynesian economics, traditional Keynesian economics, the ideas that market forces may fail to restore full employment quickly, that there's a slow adjustment process, particularly in recessions. And also that fluctuations in aggregate demand are an important source of this business instability. The macro economy is very aggregate demand driven. New Keynesians are within this broad tradition and argue that macroeconomic stabilization by the government using fiscal policy, or more often by a central bank using monetary policy, can lead to a more efficient macroeconomic outcome than free market policy or what the new classicals would recommend. So this theory is very similar to the original Keynesian economics, but as we stated, this is a micro foundations revolution new Keynesians are taking this micro foundation theory and they're using it and they're providing more detailed micro based elements to show how Keynesian macro outcomes can emerge. Two main assumptions really underlie the kind of updated Keynesian approach or the new Keynesian approach to macroeconomics. One is rational expectations and the other is imperfect competition. So new Keynesian macro analysis usually does assume that households and firms have rational expectations. But then we add to this the idea of imperfect competition. New Keynesian analysis usually focuses on how even with rational expectations theory, we can still get a variety of market failures. In particular, new Keynesians assume that there is imperfect competition 
in price and wage setting to help explain why prices and wages can become sticky. This idea of wage and price stickiness and other market failure ideas that are present in new Keynesian models imply that an economy may fail to attain full employment, even with rational expectations theory in the model. So let's look at the increased details of this discussion that is brought about within the idea of new Keynesian economics. The first concept we're going to cover here is that new Keynesians explore the existence of unemployment in the first place. The new classicals are kind of arguing that, you know, unemployment is almost like a voluntary thing here. Given rational economic agents, how do we have unemployment? How do we kind of get stuck at a point where markets aren't really, really clearing? The new Keynesians have this concept called efficiency wages. Efficiency wages are above market wages that may be the best way to lower labor costs for a firm, right? So when we pay efficiency wages, we're paying above the market clearing rate. Why would you do this? Well, what happens to your employees when you pay efficiency wages or higher wages than the market clearing rate? Now all of a sudden, they may have this fear of being laid off. There may be less a chance of them leaving. They may work harder to avoid getting laid off. It might create loyalty to your, your company. It might boost morale, other reasons like this, right? So you might pay efficiency wages to make sure that you are getting the best out of the individuals that you actually can. Some of the explanations are adverse selection based because it's costly to find the best employee for some potential job. Right? Some firms might offer a higher wage that attracts better workers in general, which increases the percentage chance that good workers are actually hired, that they're actually offered the position. Right? And this is a problem of adverse selection that we can go through. Right? I know I've offered efficiency wages to uh, babysitters in the past to watch my children. I want to make sure that really good people are there, and I want to make sure that they want to come babysit for me so that if I, say, need a babysitter last minute and shoot them a text message, I'm not really putting them in any kind of predicament where they don't want to come and work for me. Instead, they really want to come work for me. So they love to get the phone call from me or the text message from me, right? In efficiency wage models, workers are paid at levels that maximize productivity instead of clearing the market. There's lots of explanations for why that may happen, but what we're doing is we're paying this above market clearing wage rate. So since each firm pays more than the market clearing wage, the aggregated labor market fails to clear, right? There's lots of different kinds of models. There's shirking models within the efficiency wage theory uh, that were particularly influential. Uh, so Shapiro and Stiglitz in 1984 had one work where they talked about employers paying above the market rate for work, ensuring that workers want to remain employed with that company. But since all firms do this, since all firms are worried about their employees kind of shirking on them, so they pay them more than what the market clearing wage rate would be, right? Since all firms do this, the threat to a current employee becomes not having to work for the no premium rate for the market clearing rate. Instead, the threat is, hey, you're gonna be unemployed. Like if you lose your job with us, you're going to be unemployed because unemployment exists now. There's not this market clearing mechanism where everybody kind of gets paid and hey, you know, uh, the market clears and there's no unemployment out there, right? So the threat is actually unemployment versus the premium wage, the efficiency wage, the higher than market clearing wage rate that I am paying you. So this overcomes other issues like what's called a principal agent problem in economics as well, where employees tend to avoid work. They shirk unless firms can monitor worker effort and threaten slacking employees with unemployment. We don't have to worry about this problem as much anymore because the threat of getting caught is really, really high. You could end up unemployed as opposed to making really great wages. What the new Keynesians have done then is introduced non-market clearing elements to the labor market. Wages don't perfectly clear the labor market and coordinate all behavior. Unemployment can exist, right? So we have these kind of non-efficient markets going on. The next step in the argument is that adjustments within this market 
create even more imperfection. The new Keynesians utilize the micro foundations of what are called sticky wages to show that the adjustment process of the labor market, which is massively important when thinking about macroeconomics, is slow to adjust. Right, so the labor market is slow to adjust. Not only does it not clear perfectly, but then when things change, it doesn't change very quickly. Particularly in situations where the economy is in a recession and wages need to drop. In the aggregate supply, aggregate demand model, this would be a case where the short run aggregate supply curve needs to move out for us to get to full employment in response to an economic downturn. We need resource prices to drop. So why won't these prices adjust quickly. The new Keynesians have micro foundation explanations for this as well, the idea of sticky wages. So we have three reasons for sticky wages, especially in the downward direction. The first one is this idea of fairness that comes from behavioral economics. So the argument is that our sense of fairness may constrain what we actually do. Behavioral economics has provided a lot of survey data and other empirical evidence to try and back up this claim. Just think about it. Many people feel that pay cuts, especially nominal ones, are unfair. If our original worker has been working in a job for, say, three years, and they get paid $45,000 a year, and then a similar industry moves in across town, but it's during a bit of a downturn in the economy, and the new firm, it's hiring similarly skilled workers at $38,000 a year. Is it fair to cut our original worker's wages from 45,000 to 38,000 a year? They've been working at $45,000 a year for three years. Most people think this isn't fair. What is viewed as fair can restrict firm behavior. It can cause us to not be able to lower prices even though the macro economy requires it. Having the macro economy's aggregate supply and aggregate demand equilibrium below full employment does not automatically change the public perception of fairness. Note that this seems particularly true when wages need to go down. Pay raises tend to seem a little bit more fair to the average person's mindset. Behavioral economics has thus provided us with something important to think about. We aren't perfectly calculated and rational creatures. Notice too that a sort of money illusion ties into this idea. Money illusion is the idea that we mistake the face value or the nominal value for the purchasing power of money or the real value. We may be more willing to take real pay cuts as long as they're not nominal pay cuts. This ties into this fairness idea. Most people view a 3% raise in a situation with 4% inflation more favorably than a 2% raise with 2% inflation. Right? If we consider these two options, a 3% raise, but with 4% inflation happening in the economy, and a 2% raise with 2% inflation happening, most people think, hey, the 3% raise is better. Right? The nominal value has gone up more, 3% versus 2%. And so we would be totally fine with a 2% raise with 2% inflation, but we would be very happy with a 3% raise and 4% inflation, even though we are actually taking a real pay cut. Now this can't happen if it's too extreme, but the issues of fairness and money illusion here really bring a lot of kind of mess to the labor market and the limitations of what firms can actually do. Nominal cuts don't seem fair, but since we're fooled to some extent by inflation, New Keynesians will emphasize that our take on fairness may be such that we may be willing to take real pay cuts as long as they are not nominal pay cuts. So if we use the hyper-rational homo economicus assumptions of the neoclassical microeconomic model, fairness issues should be a complete non-factor and employees understand nominal versus real trade-offs. In that model, we're all calculating and thus nothing like emotional fairness prevents markets from clearing. Behavioral econ then provides a microeconomics that can help explain how those markets could possibly not clear and new Keynesian issues of fairness here could come into play to create rigidity within the labor market.
Our second reason for wage stickiness, in particular in the downward direction, is menu costs, right? Now this one would hold in kind of either direction, up or down, uh, but menu cost is this idea that changing the cost is costly, right? Lowering our cost is actually costly. The idea is pretty straightforward. It's the idea of if you're a restaurant and you have a menu, it is costly to change that menu. There's a cost to changing your menu of prices. Printing new menus at a restaurant is costly. Advertisements need to be redone. If you've done a marketing campaign and you say, hey, we're offering this for $5, right? You have to realize that that marketing campaign now has you kind of locked in. You've promised something. The cost is $5, right? Um, so these are nominal price rigidity theories. The menu cost idea is a nominal price rigidity theory that there's you know kind of this stickiness, this rigidity to the nominal price, to the price tag that you actually see. In 1985, Akerlof, who went on to win a Nobel Prize, and Janet Yellen, who's an eventual Fed chairman, put forward the idea that firms will not want to change their price unless the benefit is more than some small amount, the cost of this kind of menu cost change. In 1999, there was a paper by Dixon and Hansen that argued that even if menu costs only apply to a small sector of the economy, this could still influence a slow responsiveness of prices to the rest of the economy. So there's modern work kind of being done in this menu cost realm of price stickiness. The third reason after our behavioral fairness issue and the menu cost issue is that we have coordination problems and that can cause this wage stickiness in particular in the downward direction. Coordination problems can arise in a setting of wages and prices because those who set them must also anticipate the actions of other wage and price setters. Right? And this can create some kind of coordination problems between wage earners and wage setters and different firms and different options. There can be situations where contracts are staggered, such as uh, Calvo's 1983 important paper, which shows a lack of overall market coordination as firms change prices and respond at different times because they're locked into different contracts. Right? If my contract comes up now and your contract comes up in a month, but we're competing in the same market, right? the dynamics of how do I know what's gonna happen in the next few weeks with your price change is gonna impact what my price change should be. And we can get kind of a kind of coordination mess here. right? So the price adjustment process can get slowed very quickly by these kind of overlapping, staggered, non-coordinated issues. So in short with this, the New Keynesians utilize the economic models of imperfect competition to try to show a slow adjustment process for wages. So what we have here is three different rationales for sticky wages. We have the behavioral fairness issue, the fact that there could be menu costs, and then also coordination problems. These can create sticky wages. Wage and price stickiness matters greatly to our macroeconomic debate because if prices just adjust rapidly, the economy will self-correct. Things will work out and markets will clear pretty quickly, even the macro markets, right? So we can think of our aggregate supply, aggregate demand model as clearing and getting to long run equilibrium quite easily. When we're in a recession, resource prices fall and the economy just jumps back to full employment. When the economy is overheating, prices rise and the economy comes back to its potential output. With price rigidity, the economy can once again end up in a Keynesian situation. The macro economy can become stuck and stuck in a non-optimal way. All right, guys, so that's new Keynesian economics. For more macroeconomics, click on the video linked here.